Hello Year 7 and welcome to the lessons 19 to 21. As you can see from our title, today's lesson is titled Homesickness. Now before we get started, if you don't have a copy of Boy or your copy of the Home Learning Booklet, pause this video and go and find those things now because you will need them for this set of lessons. As I said, our title today is Homesickness and our learning objective is to review the presentation of adults in the story so far. And I did touch on this a couple of lessons ago. We spoke about the fact that adults in Roald Dahl's stories are often presented as the enemy. Lots of adults in Roald Dahl's stories, and in particular in Boy as well, are presented as being nasty, as being cruel and being very bossy. And so we spoke about a few lessons ago why Roald Dahl does this and where he wants your sympathy to be whilst reading his stories. Most of the time that sympathy is with the children in the story. So today we're going to be thinking about the presentation of adults so far thinking about those mean, horrible adults that we've looked at, and then thinking about a new adult that is introduced that isn't mean and why that might be. So my first question to you today is, when was the last time you ever felt homesick? Now, some of you might be sat there thinking, I've never felt homesick before. I don't know what it feels like to feel homesick, but I'm sure most of you have probably experienced homesickness yourselves. And I want you to think, what makes you feel that way? So you put the question in your home learning booklet. You've got a little bit of space to answer that question. What makes you feel homesick and why do we feel homesick? Now, I know I felt a little bit homesick when um, last year I went on holiday, I went abroad and um, I just bought a new puppy. And so I had to leave him and my mum looked after him for me and he had a lovely time with um, my mum. But the whole time I was on holiday, I just kept feeling homesick because I wanted to be at home with my dog. So I want you to have a think, when have you felt homesick? Maybe you went on a school residential trip at primary school. Maybe you went to PGL. What was it like? Why did you feel homesick? And then there's a challenge question on there for you. In what ways is homesickness, although it's mostly a sad feeling, how can it be a positive thing? Why is being homesick positive? What does it make you appreciate maybe when you do get home? So you can answer that in your home learning booklet as well. Now, what I'd like you to do is have a think at, with regards to our learning objective, reviewing the presentation of adults in the story so far. Which adults have we come across in Boy so far? And there's an example in your home learning booklet for you. So the first one that we've looked at is Mrs. Pratchett. So have a think. For each adult you can think of, can you add an adjective? So the ones to be done for you, Mrs. Pratchett is vengeful, meaning that she wants revenge and she does get her revenge, as we've read so far. You've actually got a little table in your home learning booklet there. So you can put along the first row who the um, adult is and then along the second row you can write that adjective to describe them. Just off the top of my head you could do Mr Coombs, you could do Mrs Dahl, um, you could do the headmaster at St Peter's. I want you to have a think about all of the adults that we've looked at in the story so far and if you need to use your work from last lesson or a couple of lessons ago then use that maybe as well but you need to think of an adjective to describe each of them maybe the matron as well we looked at before so think of an adjective to describe the matron as well when you've done that we just think what is the general trend of the way that Roald Dahl presents adults and i touched on this earlier but you'll, you'll notice from your adjectives are do they present um, the adults in the stories as being very kind-hearted or instead are they presented as being very mean-spirited are they presented in a very negative way so when you filled out the little table you've got the characters in it you've got the adjectives to describe them maybe you could color code them are they positive adjectives or are they negative adjectives so let's have a think about that and see, figure out what is the general trend of the way that the adults are presented in Roald Dahl's stories Right, I now need you to read the chapter titled Homesickness from Boy. So find your copy, whether it's the online copy, the, P the audio book copy or your home physical copy of the book. And I'd like you to read the chapter to Homesickness. Whilst you're reading, think about the adults that Roald Dahl describes in this chapter and how they are presented. Now that you have read the chapter, I'd like you to think about the character of Dr Dunbar. Is this the first kind adult that Roald has come across in his story so far? So those of you that have read the chapter will know that Roald falls a sickie. He's desperate to go home because he's feeling homesick. And so he pretends he's got appendicitis. He goes to visit Dr Dunbar and Dr Dunbar lies for him and tells, says, tells, tells his mother that he's not very well and that he needs a couple more days at home. So I want you to think, is this the first kind adult that Roald has come across 
or um, had you come across the other kind adults before? Then what you to think, what would you have done if you were in the doctor's position? Would you have told on him or would you have helped to keep his secret? Do you think it's right that he had a couple more days at home or do you think that later on down the line he'll just feel homesick again and he needs to learn how to deal with his homesickness maybe? When you've done that, I'd like you to type in the YouTube link on the slide or instead, if you'd find it easier, you can search for the video that I'm going to show you. And this video is for the film trailer for a film called Ferris Bueller's Day Off. You might have never heard that film before. It's a film from the 80s. but It's a very funny film about a boy who pulls a sickie. He doesn't want to go to school, so he um, he bunks off, we say, and he has an amazing day because of that. So he doesn't go into school and it, it follows follows his journey on his day off and the fact that he has an amazing day off instead of going to school and the fact that he's pulled a sickie. So I want you to watch that trailer if you can and that might give you inspiration for what we're going to do next lesson. Now as you can see from the spider diagram on the slide and there are boxes in the next lesson in your home learning booklet where you can fill out your ideas for this slide. I would like you, what we're going to be working towards is a short story about a person pretending to be ill and these six questions are going to help you in planning for that short story. So the six questions are where will they be when they are pretending to be poorly? Are they going to just be stuck at home having a lazy day watching Netflix? Don't think that sounds like a very exciting story. Maybe they want to they're going to call in sick because they want to go to a concert or because their favourite celebrity is going to be in town or something like that. You can have a think. Where will they be when they are pretending to be poorly? I'd like you to think, will there be a moral at the end of the story? Are you going to teach your reader that pulling sickies and, and lying is wrong or is it all going to pay off and it's going to be worthwhile for the main character? Will they be caught out or will they get away with it? So is there going to be somebody hunting them during the story? Those of you that have seen the film Ferris Bueller's Day Off will know that there's a teacher that's on to him and also his older sister. She doesn't believe that he's actually poorly either. So will he get away with it or will he get caught? Who is your main character and who will they be pretending to, who are they be lying to? So who is it they're going to be faking to? Is it their parents? Is it their boss at work? Maybe your story is going to be about an adult that calls in sick. What are they trying to avoid and why? Maybe there's a big meeting or maybe um, there's exams. Maybe um, they've got into a fight with one of their friends so they don't want to see one of their friends. And how will they convince everyone that they are ill? What are they going to be doing? How are they going to pretend to be poorly? Are they going to say they've got a cold? They're going to be coughing and sneezing? Or are they going to pretend it's something more serious. So I'd like you to have a think. You're going to write a short story about a person pretending to be ill and at this point you can plan for it. So you can use the boxes on the next lesson in your home learning booklet to help you plan for your short story. Okay, so lesson 20 then, and you'll see from our title that today you're going to be doing a narrative writing challenge. And we have two different types of writing. We have narrative and descriptive. Now, narrative means to tell a story and descriptive, obviously, is to describe something. So today you're going to be practicing our narrative writing in relation to the chapter titled Homesickness. So you're going to be thinking about the story that you want to tell. Now, before we do that, we're just going to talk very quickly about some punctuation skills practice, because quite often this is something we take for granted and you spend a long time at primary school learning punctuation skills and we don't really focus on it in as much detail as we'd like at secondary school. So we're going to be thinking about that today. Now, when writing dialogue and direct speech, there are some important rules that you must follow. So some people forget this and then we have dialogue that doesn't look like dialogue. It just looks like part of the narrative. But everything that's in dialogue dialogue or spoken out loud goes inside speech marks and you can see them on the slide where the word speech marks is written it's actually in speech marks so all punctuation belonging to the dialogue goes inside the speech marks you must use a new line for every new person who speaks okay so if you're in a conversation with people and there are two people having a conversation all of the lines need to be on each sorry each line of speech said by a new person needs to be on a new line Okay. Don't forget that dialogue can go on for several sentences and you can start a new sentence with dialogue. Um, you don't have to say, and then he said, blah, 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 blah. You can start each sentence with dialogue. OK, so if you need to pause this and you want to make a little bit of a note of it, um, you want to remember it, then you can do that. But it re it's really important that you punctuate your dialogue properly. 
Now, we've got an example there for you. What is wrong in the following bit of dialogue? And the sentence says, who is it? Asked Jim. I've got a phone, so I'm calling the police. Now, you'll see that there is no punctuation in that sentence at all. And you really need to put the punctuation in that sentence for me. So in your home learning booklet, you've got the sentence written out and it says add six pieces of punctuation to correct it. So I want you to have a thing in the speech marks the speech mark before counts as one and the speech mark mark after the dialogue counts as one so that's six pieces so i want you to have a think what should it look like if you were going to put the punctuation in pause the video if you need a little bit of extra time and then i'm going to give you the answer so no cheating there we go the answer's there for you so who is it asked jim i've got a new phone so i'm calling the police so you can see there we've got one before the who, one after the question mark, because that question mark belongs to the dialogue. So it goes inside the speech marks. OK, so we're going to have a go at another one. If you didn't get it right, then write down the right answer there on your home learning booklet. But we're going to have a go at another piece of dialogue. Next one then. So what is wrong with this one? Hello, said Mary. Hello there, replied Sarah. So I want you to have a think, what's wrong with this one? Could you change the punctuation anyway? Can you think about where the punctuation should go? Is it in the right place? And there it is. Each piece of dialogue should be on a new line. OK, so hello, said Mary. Hello there, replied Sarah. And that's the big one that catches a lot of people out. They don't realise that if a new person is talking, it should be on a new line. And then finally, last one we're going to have a go at. Can we have beans for tea? Called Paul down to his mum. I like my beans with ketchup. So we need to have a think there. What is wrong with that line? Think about all those rules from that previous slide that I told you about. And actually the slide and the punctuation skills is in your home learning booklet. So use that to help you if you need to. Can we have beans for tea? Called, called Paul down to his mum. I like beans with my ketchup. What's wrong with that piece of dialogue? There we go. And that's what's wrong with it. You might remember I told you earlier that the dialogue needs to have the punctuation within the speech mark so you can see the question mark is put outside the speech marks it needs to be within the speech marks similarly with that full stop there it needs to go inside the speech marks and not outside of it so if you haven't got that right then make sure you change it in your home learning booklet make sure you write down where the correct dialogue goes Now, you'll recognise this spider diagram from last lesson. And this spider diagram is the one that you use to start planning for your short story. So we've got the ideas in here. Just revisit that if you have taken a break between the two lessons. Make sure you know what your short story is going to be about, who your main character is, what they're trying to avoid, how you're going to convince people that they're ill. Will they be caught out or get away with it? What's the moral at the end of the story? And where will they be when they are pretending to be poorly? So now that you have thought about all of those and you've revisited it from last lesson, we're just going to be start thinking about the methods in your short story so you can see on here then um the the methods that you're going to try, try to include so we've got dialogue that's just direct speech and then we're going to go through each of these things in a little bit more detail and i'll explain the vocab challenge to you as well OK, so these methods on this slide here then are just three of the ones that I'd like you to try and include in your short story. So as I said before, you're writing a short story about someone pretending to be sick. So you need to try and see if you can include any of these things. Can you include dialogue? So dialogue is direct speech spoken aloud from one character to another. So it's a conversation or a speech from one character to another. Maybe someone's giving somebody else instructions. An example on there for you. Why are you out of bed? Mum asked. I'm just going to the toilet, I said gripping my stomach and don't forget those punctuation skills that we've spoken about before when looking at direct speech too you can see there's two separate lines there one for mum and one for the narrator second thing i'd like you to try and include is some foreshadowing and foreshadowing is when you hint at a future event in the story so these can act as a warning for what's to come you're giving your reader a hint about what's going to happen later on there's a hint there she's never home before five on a monday and then maybe later on it's going to be the one day that the parent comes home before five o'clock and therefore the child gets caught out or it was the first time he'd ever lied to her it would also be the last maybe there's going to be another lie later on and another one and another one and so that's foreshadowing the fact that there are going to be later lies in the story next thing i'd like to try and include is some contrast and it's a bit of a difficult idea but 
put simply it is just two opposite ideas or images so she was not the bold bright strong athlete of normal days today she was weak pale and looked like she needed a good meal so you can see there's contrast there between how the girl normally looks bold bright and strong but then today she was weak pale and looked like she could do with a good meal so there's contrast there two opposite images maybe we've got twins and one of them is really really poorly and one of them is just pretending to be poorly and so there's two opposite images there for you that you could contrast you've also got these um examples and the definitions of these methods on your in your home learning booklet so don't forget to have a look at those a simile try and include a simile my heart was beating like a bongo drum and also i lay as still as a statue there are two similes there that you could try and include that would present your character as feeling quite nervous maybe my heart was beating like a bongo drum that's a good one you can imagine the rhythmic beating of the heart as the character is waiting for their mum to decide whether they have to go in or not and if you're maybe doing it about your boss calls you to find out how you're feeling later on in the day but you're actually stood at a concert you're trying to pretend like you're not there um so see if you can include a simile some emotive language language used to evoke feeling often sympathy but could be pride or affection so my poor sick suffering child or his pitiable wife was delirious and feverish think about how you're going to use some emotive language to feel sorry for the person maybe actually you could spin it on his head and feel sorry to the person that's being lied to so maybe it's someone has been let down by their friend they they've decided to they're going to ditch their friend and do something else maybe they you're, you might create sympathy for the friend in that situation and the last bit, but not least i'd like you to try and include an exclamation mark and i'm sure all of you can do that without fail so punctuation used for commands or shocking sentences i had been caught or get back to bed you can see those exclamation marks there what I'd like you to do now is plan your use of the writer's methods for this writing challenge. And you've got the boxes in your writing, um, in your home learning booklet to be able to do it. What I'd like you to do now is think about some examples of dialogue that you can use, some foreshadowing. And then this way, when you do your writing challenge, you can just tick them off as and when you've included them. So use the home learning booklet there to help you plan in even more detail for your ideas. Think about foreshadowing that you can use think about the emotive language try and be inventive and creative what examples of these methods can you produce and then I'd like you to have a go at writing your short story. So it should take you about 40 minutes. It's not going to be um, pages and pages and pages because it's a short story. Likewise, it should definitely be at least one to two pages long. So if it's less than a page, then you probably haven't done it in enough detail. And you can see there's a vocab challenge on this sheet as well on this slide. Sorry. So you can see we've got the word milady. So that word meaning illness. The word fictitious, meaning pretend or made up, and then um, you've got the word penitent, which means to be sorry or feel apolog apologetic. So you've got the definitions for those words in your home learning booklet as well. Now, pause this video, have a go at completing your writing challenge. Like I said, it's for, it should be about 40 minutes long and you've got two pages in your um, home landing booklet to complete that on there. Don't forget to save it when you've done it. Um, if you want to, afterwards, you can go through and proofread and edit your work. That's really what you should be doing with every piece of work that you do. Perhaps you could pass it on to an older relative to read and see what they think about it. Did they enjoy reading your story? Maybe you could ask them for some feedback. And the last thing I want you to do is self-assess it. It says peer assessment on this slide. I want you to self-assess it. I want you to be thinking about the, the way that you can self-assess. First of all, by highlighting and labelling all the methods that you've used. Highlight the dialogue, the foreshadowing, the contrast, the simile, the emotive language and the exclamation mark. Circle any errors that you find. Hopefully you haven't relied on spell check too much because that would have found the errors for you. But if you did find any errors, you can have a look at those and see if you can correct them. Give yourself a what went well comment and an even better if comment. Maybe your even better if comment could be maybe be a little bit more creative. Maybe you could include some more dialogue. Um, maybe it doesn't have to be so repetitive. And then sign and date your self-assessments. So think about what you've done well, what could you improve on, and then sign and date it to show that you've, you've reflected on the work that you've completed. 
Again, then your last lesson from this video is based on the chapter from Boy titled A Drive in the Motor Car. So this is a really significant incident that happened during Roldal's childhood, and it's one that he remembers with great detail. And our learning objective today is to explore the issue of young drivers. So as well as reading the chapter titled A Drive in the Motor Car, you're also going to be reading a non-fiction article about the issue of young drivers. So you'll need a copy of Boy and also your home learning booklet. Now, we need to have a think, what do you make of these facts? Drivers aged 16 to 19 are a third more likely to die in a crash than drivers over aged 40 to 49. So a third more likely, there's um, a, th a third more of a chance that they will die in a crash if they're aged 70, 16 to 19 than if they're aged 40 to 49. One in four 18 to 24 year olds crash within two years of passing their driving test. And then young male drivers are involved in a lot more crashes than young female drivers. So I need to have a think, what do you make of these facts? Why do you think it might be that young male drivers are involved in a lot more crashes than young female drivers? Why do you think it is that one in four 18 to 24 year olds crash within two years of passing their driving test? What do they not have that maybe other drivers, particularly those aged 40 to 49, what do they have that young Younger people do not have. So we need to have a think about these facts, these statistics. Now I'd like you to read the chapter A Drive in the Motor Car and as you read try and keep an eye out for any structural features. So foreshadowing and I spoke to you last lesson about what foreshadowing was, contrast, change in focus, motifs and dialogues. We've looked at those structure techniques throughout this scheme of work. So I'd like you to think where is it hinted at early on in the chapter that something bad is going to happen later and whilst reading this chapter you might be thinking about the type of car that's described and on this slide there's a really good picture of one for you there you can see that there aren't windows on the side of the car there are only windows on the front and the back of the car so have a think whilst you're reading the chapter about this car in this picture and how this would have made the experience very different compared to the cars that we have today So there are some hints on here for you just in case you were stuck. Was it hinted that they will crash the car? What two different atmospheres are created? Maybe a really happy and excited atmosphere at the beginning of the chapter. Maybe later on it was more um, serious and scary. If this were a film, what would the camera zoom in on and when? Particularly if you've read the chapter now, you should have read it. Um, think about when Roald Dahl's nose was almost sliced in two. Where would the camera have zoomed in on that? Maybe zoomed in on his family's faces instead when they realised what his nose, what had happened to his nose. What is constantly made reference to throughout the chapter? Think about that motif. Maybe is um, his sister constantly made reference to his sister's age, maybe. And then who speaks and why? Whilst reading the chapter, and now that you've read the chapter, perhaps you could go back through and think about which of these you managed to spot and which you found more difficult. Now we're going to be looking at the, uh, the article and it's in your home learning booklet. Um, so you'll need that in front of you young drivers are most vulnerable and you've got five questions to answer on that article and those five questions are also on your quiz that you've got for this week on show my homework as well so i'm going to read the article out to you um if you don't want to listen to me read it you can just skip this little bit but you've got the article in your home well learning booklet so you'll need to read that now young drivers are still the most vulnerable a report has revealed a quarter of young drivers crash in the first six months after passing their test a report released by today by the AA reveals that almost a quarter of young drivers crash in the first six months after passing their test. Furthermore, nearly 40% of drivers have a crash by the time that they are 23. That's according to Young Drivers at Risk, which is based on the findings of a survey of more than 14,000 drivers. An analysis of the driver's first crashes revealed that they were most likely to happen in the daytime, only 13% happen at night, and that bad weather was only a factor in 15% of cases. 63% of people have their first crash without passengers in the car. Mansell, a member of the Commission for Global Road Safety, said, This is a vitally important issue which doesn't get enough attention. Too many of our young people are still being killed or injured on the roads. These are preventable tragedies. The report was compiled by the AA and the Make Roads Safer campaign and calls for young drivers to be given more opportunities to drive in safe off-road environment before they turn 17 and are able to take their test. Edmund King, director of the AA, said road safety education must be a life skill that starts at the age of three but is continually refreshed throughout life. It needs to begin many years before someone is old enough to apply for their provisional licence. 
If teenagers have had interesting and practical road safety education, they are less likely to take dangerous risks when they get behind the wheel alone. Road crashes are not only the leading cause of death and injury for young people in the UK, but also across the world. We need safer drivers in safer cars on safer roads to, re to reduce these preventable deaths in the UK and across the globe. The report has been endorsed by the Institute of Advanced Motorists, Simon Best, Chief, Chief Executive, said. Young male drivers especially suffer from a deadly combination of overconfidence and inexperience. Post-test training is without a doubt the best way to address this. A focus on road safety in the national curriculum is currently non-existent. This needs to change. Driver training for under 17 year olds can be a fun way of introducing young people to safe driving. In order to assist new motorists, the AA is offering 1,003 driver improvement courses for those who have recently passed their test. Details can be found on the AA website. Okay, so that's the article for you. Um, what I'd like you to do now is in your home learning booklet, you've got the questions. I'd like you to have a go at answering those. So what percentage of young drivers crash at night? Who argues that road safety education must be a life skill that begins at the age of three? What is the leading cause of death and injury for young people? What do young male drivers suffer with a combination of? And what does Simon Best argue should be added to the national curriculum? So pause this video, see if you can find the answers. These questions will test your reading comprehension. So if that's something you know you struggle with, it's really important that you take this opportunity to practice that skill. And the answer is there for you then. So the question was, what percentage of young drivers crash at night? 13 percent, which is quite surprising, really, when you think about the risks that are increased during nighttime driving. But it might be that younger drivers maybe don't drive as much at night because they might be quite scared to and they might be aware of the risks. So only 13 percent of drivers, young drivers crash at night. Edmund King, director of the AA, he argues that road safety education must be a life skill that starts at the age of three. The leading cause of death and injury for young people is road crashes and road traffic collisions, which is, again, quite surprising. You'd think that it would be something else, but actually that's the leading cause of death of injury and young people. Um, it's road crashes. Um, young male drivers, according to this article, suffer with a combination of overconfidence and inexperience. And I spoke earlier about the fact that um, a third more, it was a third more likely that um, dri young drivers would crash than those aged between 40 and 49. And that might just be because of the experience that those drivers have had. It's very likely that those drivers have been driving for a long time, as opposed to those that have recently passed their test. Also, this issue of overconfidence as well. That's what the writer of this article accuses young male drivers of being is overconfident. And then finally, Simon Best argues that um, a focus on road safety should be added to the national curriculum. Okay. A focus on road safety in the national curriculum is currently non-existent. This needs to change. Driver training for under 17 year olds can be a fun way of introducing young people to safe driving. How might we integrate road safety driving skills into our national curriculum? So you might know that at Braden, we don't study road safety or driving skills at all. Do you think this is something that should be done? And I'd like you to spider diagram your ideas in the big box in your home learning booklet. So use that big box to help to help think about your ideas. How can we integrate road safety driving skills into the national curriculum do you think we should have a road safety lesson do you think that should be part of something um, that's included in global citizenship maybe we should think in your glo your, in your gc lessons about road safety in more specifically do you think it should be age appropriate you might remember at primary school learning about um the green cross code code and thinking about crossing the road what, how could you develop that further up school and think about road safety and driving skills? Maybe in year 11, perhaps um, you could think in a little bit more detail about learning to drive before you can actually get your provisional license. So those of you that don't know, when you turn 17, you get a provisional license, which gives you the um, opportunity to learn how to drive. And it's only when you've got one of those that you're actually allowed to learn how to drive. And that's only when you're 17 years old. Maybe learning to drive should be something taught earlier on in life so that when you're 17, you just have to take your test. I think about that. Do you think that sounds safe? Or do you think that driving is a skill that actually not everybody needs to have? So use the spider diagram box to help think about your ideas. 
Now, you can see on this slide, there's information about, and it says it in your um, home learning booklet, about your um, about the campaign Safe Drive Stay Alive. And it's a tour that takes place. And those of you that have got older brothers and sisters, you might have um, siblings that have been in year 11 and therefore have taken part in this tour. So it says here, Safe Drive Stay Alive is produced by a road safety partnership, including Thames Valley and Hampshire Police Forces, local councils and emergency services. Each partner has been working for years to reduce the number of people dying on the roads. And by the end of this year, they have welcomed over 268,000 young people through the doors of a Safe Drive presentation. The good news is that since 2004, the number of under 25s killed in car crashes has fallen by nearly three quarters but there is still more to do through a combination of roads policing road safety education engineering measures and speed enforcement thames valley and hampshire areas have been have seen road casualties who are killed or seriously injured fall to an all-time low by the end of 2013 however a disproportionate number of these remain young inexperienced drivers and sometimes they don't help themselves the safe drive stay alive campaign will reach new and pre-drivers in an emotive and hard-hitting way influencing behavior and attitude on the roads now if you would like to and you don't have to at this point because it is very difficult to watch and quite emotional you can follow the youtube link that's on this slide and you can have a look at the video it's the trailer for the safe drive stay alive tour now i went with the year 11s um that left um last year and i watched the safe drive stay alive tour and it's definitely very eye-opening and very informative but it's also very emotional and difficult to watch because there are parents of young people who have died in car crashes there are police officers that come there are um, firefighters that have been the first to arrive on the scene and have had to deal with the deaths of people during these um, car crashes and so it's a really really difficult experience you will probably get to experience it yourself when you are in year 11 so only watch that trailer for the safe drive presentation if you are up to it please do not watch it if you know that you are quite sensitive and therefore find it a difficult thing to watch so i've told you a little bit about it if you would like to you can follow the youtube link there to watch the trailer for the presentation now, what I'd like you to do is turn the car crash into a piece of drama integrating the structural features. So what I mean by that is perhaps you could write a script based on the car crash between Roald Dahl and his family and his older half sister who feels really confident at driving. But then she has that crash. Maybe you could think about the um, man that comes and tells them to get out of the road. Think about Roald's nose. What are his family going to do when they realise what happened to him? But that's your next task is to try and turn the car crash into a piece of drama to see if you can include those techniques this is a bit of a creative narrative writing for you can you try and include some foreshadowing some contrast a change of focus perhaps you could write a script think about the different characters that you'd need think about the roles that they would play and the dialogue that would take place between these characters when you've done that you finish this lesson so really well done you're up to lesson 21 now in the scheme of work